Hi, welcome to the Call Within podcast. I'm your host, Amy Hogan. I'm a life coach, retreat leader, and breathwork facilitator who is here to support you in taking consistent action on your dreams to live a life of meaning and pleasure. I'll share with you insights, tools, and stories to help you answer the call within. Let the adventure begin. Hello and welcome to episode six. It's so good to be here with you today. Our guest today is Taylor May Dean. I met Taylor in March 2019 when she was the chef at our Sedona retreat. I originally found her through Instagram and once I saw her beautiful food photos, I knew that she was the person I would love to have as our chef. Her food is amazing. It's so delicious and she definitely kept us well nourished. It was a real treat and one of the highlights of that week for sure. What I love and appreciate about Taylor is her honesty, her humility, her kindness, and her magical creativity. Let me share Taylor's official bio with you so you can get to know a little bit more about her before we dive into the interview. Taylor May Dean is a plant-based chef, recipe creator, and food photographer servicing the area of Sedona, Arizona. She started her vegan chef service via her business, Cooking with Love LLC, in 2017. Since opening her business, she's been cooking and organizing high-vibe food for countless retreats and private dinners. Her clientele include a myriad of different people vacationing in the area or retreating, looking to experience deeper connection and evolution in the Red Rocks of Sedona. She's a meditator, yogi, former commercial organic farmer, and big-time nature enthusiast who shares her love and passion for food, storytelling, and ahimsa through her unique cuisine and recipes. Let's dive in. Hi, Taylor. Thank you so much for being here, and welcome to the Call Within podcast. Thank you, Amy, for having me. I'm very excited about this. Me too. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more about your story. And I think that everyone listening to this podcast is going to get so much out of what you have to share. But before we go down into that story, can you share with us what you're most present to in this moment? If it's a thought, a a feeling, a sensation? Hmm. Well, you know, before we actually started the podcast, the hour before the meeting, I was like drinking my coffee and um, I actually felt like things were really slowing down because, you know, um, I just have like so much going on with uh, especially like this just time of year is really busy and I have people I got to email back and you know, it's like several people and troubleshooting. And so I really enjoyed just like slowing down and thinking about the podcast. And I don't know, I was just feeling a lot of gratitude this morning and for just the sun hitting my face and the drinking the coffee and just waking up and Um, I listened to uh, a couple things, you know, before the podcast, like a couple like, you know, gems of wisdom type things and just to be in a really good mindset for connecting with you. And yeah, those are just my my reflections. I love your like intentionality and presence and yeah, even as you're talking, I'm sitting here. I'm like, oh, so I'm just getting like more and more relaxed and like slowing down as you're sharing. And it's, yeah, it kind of calms like my own nerves or thoughts or like, oh, make sure you ask this question or that question. And it is just like really bringing me into the, into the present moment and feeling like so relaxed and, and grateful that you're here. So how do you describe an inner calling? Well, I think intuition, like that's just the first word I think about when you say inner calling, it's just like a little, 
you know, that little voice that's always kind of like directing us or guiding us. Um, and it's not like a critical voice. It's more of like, you know, cause like, I think that there is a critical voice that I have all the time as well, <laughs> but the inner calling, like, I don't think it's critical. I think it's like, um, just like, um, this little voice. It's like, Hey, why don't you do this today or do this? You know, it's, it's different. And then the mind is like, Oh, I don't have time. I'm busy. You're like, why don't you just go, you know, plant some flowers and do some weeding in the front yard and just get connected. And then my other voice is like, I don't have time to do that. <laughs> so I think that I just would, I would think it's intuition. I, um, you know, I don't know how else to describe it. Yeah. I think that's a good kind of distinction that you made there too, of like intuition and the critical voice. And even the way you're describing it, the intuition is more like suggestive and kind. And I think that's a cool distinction, even, you know, for the listeners, if they're like, how do I know it's intuition versus like, you know, how you said that critical voice and noticing like, how it speaks to you. It could be suggestive. It could be kind. Yeah. So I think that's a, a good distinction to make for, you know, if you're wanting to go down that path and listen to that voice. And so I would love for you, if you could share with us a bit about your story and, and how it started at college and, and how you're feeling. Sure. Well, um, just to give people a little bit of context um, for the story. I grew up in a very um, turbulent home, like a lot of uh, turmoil, like intoxication, violence, domestic abuse, drugs, alcohol. And it wasn't like that all the time. I mean, I would describe my family as like nice people, but like who struggle with like some really heavy problems and a lot of dysfunction. And um, I just saw early on in school, like, you know, it's so weird being a human in a body, like the body doesn't come with like an instruction manual, you know, <laughs> and it's so complex, you know, our emotions and just getting like being in a physical body and, you know, we, the way we, uh, our senses experience things like our physical senses but then also there's like more spiritual senses i think that we can like feel and um early on i think going to school i just noticed whether people were functional or not functional <laughs> you know everybody has this like baseline of dissatisfaction <laughs> you know, between people who are really got it together, really have nice families and like are wealthy. Um, cause my family wasn't very wealthy or anything, but like, there's just this level of dissatisfaction in the world. And I just could recognize that right away. And it made decision-making extremely confusing. Like just the way I was thinking about school and the, in the, in the end of like the goal <laughs> and whether achieving any goal was ever going to really bring me any happiness <laughs> and how frustrating that is, you know, to think about, you know, you need goals in life. You need a reason to get up in the morning. You need purpose. I, I guess I struggled a lot with ever really achieving things that made me feel confident or brought me any real happiness and so when I was growing up and going to high school, um, I, I just, you know, I, I just had a lot of like internal struggle with who am I? Like, what is my purpose? What am I going to do with my life? Like, you know, um, I don't have a lot going on for me in terms of like people in my life who are influencing me. Like I could see that the things that were around me, like my influences, were not positive and they weren't like going to help me become the person I wanted to be like, and the only thing I saw 
to indicate like the person I wanted to be is like people who I looked up to. So I, I could obviously just find role models who had qualities that I really liked. And I would just try to like, you know, have more of those, those qualities. And so I sure to interrupt for a second. Were they people that you knew or that you didn't know, like personally? You know, most of them were people that I knew personally, like teachers and like, um, you know, I worked at this camp for several years as a camp counselor. And there were uh, people there at the, the camp who worked there who I just thought like, wow, they really got it together. And they really seem, you know, internally like kind of happy with their life. And I, 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 there was like, I didn't know it at the time, but I was really seeking throughout my life, you know, throughout my whole life, I was really seeking like happiness and like internal, like happiness. And I didn't know how to find it. And that was a really weird thing, you know, cause you don't even know what you're looking for, but you see yeah. it in others and you're like, how do I get that? And what is it? And, um, did that answer your question? Yeah. There's so much in what you said. Um, and so I love how you like gave context first, and then maybe we can kind of go into you like answering that calling and how it came about, but something in what you said about the, everyone has this different baseline of dissatisfaction or satisfaction. And when I hear you say that, I take it to mean like everyone has a different level of like maybe what their happy happiness is, or I even thought it in terms of like the inner calling part, like everyone has this baseline of dissatisfaction and like, it's almost like how much, how heavy does it have to be until maybe people want to change or create change or not to not from a judging place or putting people down. There can also be like a complacency or a comparing like, well, I have it better than so-and-so. So like my life's probably not that bad. So I'll just keep going the way I'm going. And I'm wondering what, I don't know, maybe if you can explain more about what you meant when you said like that kind of baseline of dissatisfaction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I thought that, you know, looking from the outside in, you know, like if you have a functional family who love you and like really good relationships and if you're wealthy, I always thought of like wealth. Like I'm like wealthy people because I don't know, like in public school, they seem to really press upon you that it's so important to get a good education and to go to college and to get a good job and to like make money and to like, and it, it just kind of like, is this structure that was pressed upon me and I felt bad. Cause I was like, well, like, I'm not rich right now and my family have all these problems. And I just felt so like I had all this self pity about like what I didn't have and what other people had. And, but then I learned that what you have materially, like in terms of wealth and relationships, even to a degree, like what you have materially has nothing to do with how happy you are internally. And I was able to make that distinction because I grew up in an area actually that there's a huge disparity bet between the wealthy people and the working class. Like the disparity is like the wealthy people in my small hometown are like millionaires <laughs> and the, the, you know, middle-class people are like, you know, they make $12 an hour at the time, you know, and like, I mean, it, it's just insane the amount of, you know, and I thought, well, if you have these certain things, you would be happy. That was kind of the illusion that was pressed upon me at a young age. But I saw that the people who were wealthy and who had functional families, they were not happy. You know, I, I saw something in them that was like a dissatisfaction and that was universal. 
I could find that in people who had very little, I could find in people who had a lot, but it goes the other way too. Sometimes there's people who are satisfied with very little. And so I, I learned that our happiness has nothing to do with what we have materially. And that was like a very foundational ep- ep- epiphany I had um, sometime in high school. And it was, it really shifted the way <laughs> I was driven toward my goals. And right. that differed a lot from many people around me who were really just trying to achieve college. And my thing was like, I wasn't even sure if that would really be like fulfilling any kind of happiness in myself, or if it would make me like, feel like I'm living a purpose-filled life. Cause at the time I just couldn't decide what I wanted to do or what would make me happy or what would be satisfying. And that was like, all those decisions (laughs) were just like very, you know, you're, you're like in a forest and you're trying to find the path and you're looking around and you're just trying to find, you know, some sense of direction. And um, I think that's where the inner calling really came in for me was through like, Hey, I don't know where I am. (laughs) I don't know which way to go, (laughs) but I know I want to feel like internally happy. Like I I know I want to feel peaceful and um, experience love and love others and, but in an unconditional way. And I, I just had these, these, these desires, you know, that were really sincere. I had a lot of insincere ones too. Like I've always been dr- driven to like make money and be successful and win, but I did have like a sincere desire to find, you know, the truth, like of what, what is going to really touch me and what is really going to fill me up. And having no idea what that was, I was praying a lot um, for direction and just trying my best to, you know, listen and see what would come up for me in that regard. And then, you know, I found myself, you know, um, I, I think I, I wrote to, to you about your question. Like I found myself on the beach, you know, and I had this moment where I was in college and um, because I was going to college because I thought that was what I was supposed to do. And I realized, wow, I'm not this doesn't feel good. This feels like an over endeavor. And then I was like, well, you know, I think I need to get out of here and I need to surround myself with different people. And I was like, I think I should travel. And and then things kind of unraveled in a really interesting way. I wrote down here what you said, the traditional pathway to happiness, because I know there's definitely something maybe like you said, it was around you and what you saw and, you know, sometimes how we grow up, it's like this traditional pathway to happiness. And I think that's actually interesting because it's been a bit of like a common theme and the other people that I've talked to so far for, for this show, it's that, you know, they thought maybe it was going to be like finding a relationship or starting a family or getting a certain job that made a certain amount of money. And then they like, found their happiness or their direction or that, um, as you call it, like the truth through other things, like if it's travel or personal discovery or other things. So, yeah, I think this ties in well with what you're saying. Like maybe you and other people are out there kind of were on that traditional pathway to happiness, but it was leading to maybe feelings of overwhelm or anxiety or this disappointment. And so from what you shared that you ended up going to Hawaii, right? Yeah. I, you know, tried, I guess, to accept, you know, like all the adults, you know, around me were like my high school counselors and things. They're like, you know, you should really, you should really go to college and you should really do this. And this is what you're supposed to do. And I tried that and I just, there was a, so much disharmony (laughs) and I could feel it. I'm like, this is so not working out. Like it's, it it just like, it was almost not meant to work out. It felt like that, like an endeavor that was just way too big. 
um, like, cause I was working two or three jobs in the restaurant industry and paying for my classes. And there was just a lack of, you know, I was not really set up to succeed in that, but there was something else that was really trying to get my attention that was pulling me that, and that was like the inner calling for me, that, that feeling, you know, and I was just like, what is it? Like, what am I supposed to be doing? Like I was praying to God, like, what do you want me to do? And I just had this moment, like, well, you know, I think I really need to get out of here for one. (laughs) I really need to move out of my family's house. And that'll be a really big shift because it was such a toxic environment. And it was just like a wise decision at the time. And I Googled like ways to travel for free And I found out about a program called Woofing, W-W-O-O-F-I-N-G. And the acronym is Worldwide Opportunity for Organic Farming. And it's a work trade program that, I mean, it happens in multiple countries. You can travel around the world living and doing a work exchange and learning about organic farming, which was something I really was really interested in. (laughs) Like I genuinely wanted to know about that more than I wanted to sit in a college classroom and fill out papers. And like, that was just so boring to me. And, um, but what was really interesting, like the moment I decided I wanted to do that, like everything fell into place. Like a woman who I met through a cooking program um, that I was volunteering for, bought me a ticket to Hawaii. (laughs) Wow. That's so generous. So generous. And she was so supportive and like, you know, I, I was lacking a lot of like a support from a mentor, you know, um, and someone, and she was like a great mentor. And she was like, I really want you to go. And my husband has all these flyer miles and, And, you know, just come over and help me do dishes a few times a week and, and we'll get you a ticket. And she helped me like pack and like understand what to pack. And, and I was, I was 19 at the time, sold my car and I couldn't find a farm on Hawaii. There was so many options. Like there's a website and they have all the options of, of farms you can go and stay at, you know, there's this one farm called hedonesia hedonesia like hedonism and you just literally do whatever you want and like there's this other farm where all you eat is fruit and bananas and like no fats and like you know there's all these like very interesting little you know places and um, I couldn't find one that coincided with my dates because I just wanted to go for three months I was going to rent a room and Hilo and then the woman who was renting the room to a farm. So she got me onto this farm where they were chanting um, mantras, doing mantra meditation. And um, so I went there and it was just all like, so interesting how everything fell into place. I went there and I discovered mantra meditation and organic farming and I, through doing those, those things, I like started to experience like that inner happiness that I was really searching for. I found like a lot of answers to my questions that I was looking for. When you said like it answered a lot of the questions that you had, is there like a particular question that you might share with us and like what you learned or what answer came? Yes. One in particular, I always growing up felt like I was at war with my body. <laughs> I'm sure many women can relate to this, but like, yes, I, just I, can. Struggled with, I struggled with my weight and I look in the mirror and I see this person and I didn't feel like the person who I saw in the mirror. You know, I felt like more beautiful, like inside than the person I saw. 
And I'm like, wow, this is what people see when they see me, they see this person. And through doing meditation, anyone, when you start meditation, one of the biggest things you learn to experience is that you're not your body, that you're actually a spiritual being in this body. And the body is like a, like a suit or a vehicle. And um, I don't mean not your body in the sense that, um, I mean, you, you are like, it is your temple. It's like sacred and it is a reflection of you, like in so many ways when we're happy, like you can see it in the eyes, you know, the eyes are like the window to the soul. And so many things are reflected through our body and and how it looks, but we can, even though we age and our body changes through our life, we stay the same. Like our spiritual self never changes. Like we're always going to be that, that person, no matter the changes our body goes through or if we get wrinkles <laughs> or if our hair turns gray, like none of that really matters, you know? Um, and so that was like a very, I don't know. It was a, it, it was a really important, I think, discovery for me. Cause when I learned that I was like, wow, like <laughs> this is, this is nice, you know, like t- to, not put so much stock or value on my body and put value in more and like, like my internal self, like, am I feeling satisfied? Am I feeling loved? Am I feeling good? Not like looking on the outside and trying to change everything. And cause you can change everything on the outside, <laughs> but if on the inside, you know, you're not nourishing your spiritual self, well, then um, the body, it doesn't matter. Very important for me. Like it relieved a lot of pain that I had felt growing up <laughs> and all the war and the struggles with my body. It just alleviated all that misunderstanding. So does it like change like how you see yourself or like when you look in at yourself in the mirror now, do you feel like they match? Or are you saying like, they might not match, but it doesn't even matter anymore. I think it's changed the way like I treat my body and my relationship to it and seeing it more as like everything it does for me (laughs) and like seeing it as like an opportunity, like I want to take care of my body, but it's like, not so much of a vanity. It's not like, oh, I'm going to go take all these diet pills and try to get really skinny. That's totally like unhealthy, you know, it's like you're sacrificing so much like uh, (laughs) uncomfortable. And it's so ridiculous to, I think, chase the idea of like living in a perfect body because it's just going to get old anyway. And it's going to, we're all going to (laughs) die. Like our bodies are going to get old and and die. And, um, it's helpful when you, when you change your relationship to it. So some days I still look in the mirror and I'm like, Oh man, like (laughs) looking rough today, (laughs) but I still try to like eat really healthy and go for a walk. And then I look in the mirror and I'm like, wow, I'm looking really good. And it's because I'm doing all these things that feel really good. And I think that's finding that to me, I found more harmony in that than, um, you know, being at war with my body all the time. Like no one has to go through it, you know, Um, just like love yourself on the inside. It'll reflect on the outside. It's like the roots, you know, the roots when you plant a tree, if the roots are really healthy, that tree is going to be awesome. It's going to have some really nice fruit. The leaves are going to be beautiful, but you have to take care of the, the roots of the tree and water it and make sure the soil's really good. So I imagine as you're like leaving home and going to this place and maybe even when you were there in Hawaii, like experiencing these new things and learning about farming and trying mantra meditation, 
is there like that fear voice that comes up or a doubting voice? Like how does it, if it shows up, like how does it show up for you? Oh my gosh. Like I remember the moment I got to that farm on Hawaii, I was like, I wanted to leave right away. (laughs) And I just, I remember being so, I just didn't want to try it. I didn't want to try chanting mantras or singing mantras or, and I just like, my mind was like, so like, not my friend at that point. Like I I was like, oh, I, but then I had this moment, I was like in the bathroom and, and uh, I saw this thing and it was like the serenity prayer, right? Have you seen the serenity prayer? Yes. Yeah. Anybody who hasn't, they can go look it up, but it's a really nice, like, it just kind of like, we're not in control of things and it, it brought me some peace and it calmed my mind enough to like, realize like, this is a nice environment. Don't run away. Don't let your fear, like stop you from experiencing something that could be really beneficial. No one's going to hurt you. Like, this was like my, my positive, like intuition talking to me, like, you're going to be okay. Just like, just like, try it. Like, just try to go out there and try to garden and, you know, and see what happens. Give it a week. Cause that first day I was like, I want to leave this is way too new. Everything's way too new is a tropical, you know, Island. And there's like all these new trees and plants and it's raining and there's new people. And, and I had never left home before and I was by myself and I was just really fucking scared. (laughs) And, you know, um, but yeah, I, I took everything one day at a time And I could like in my initial understanding of the people like who own the farm was like immediately like they're nice people like they've got it together. They're not going to hurt me. So why not just be open to listening to what they have to say and not just run away from it and not just like rebel against it and just like try to be a little more open and see it as like a foreign exchange student. And then I started trying the meditation and it took, you know, several months or whatever, but I started to see the benefits of it. And a lot of that initial like fear and stuff was like my own, my own, I want to say demons, but it was just like my own baggage, my own conditioning of what I thought things should be. And yeah, I think that's always really, really hard to get past when you're doing anything, um, or you're trying to change, like when you're trying to change it all, your mind is never going to be your friend. It's always going to be like, no, it's too hard. Don't do it. Run away. Yeah. And I feel like that happens at like each stage. Like you said, it probably happened like before you were leaving and then you kind of like, okay, it'll be fine. I'll maybe I'm like, I'll be landing on a farm. There'll be nice people there. And then you get yourself over that hump and then you get there. You're like, oh my God, this is too weird. I've never been this far away from home. And then it's like another kind of like pausing, talking to yourself. And I, yeah, I kind of see that process. Like things don't ever stop getting scary, but just like not stopping when they do get scary for you. It's that like pausing. Okay. Like talking kind to yourself, somewhat kind of like rationalizing, like, I'll just give it a try being open. That sounds like that's kind of like what calls you forward or like gets you through it. Absolutely. Yeah. All the best things in life, you know, all the really good things, you know, are always so many uh, moats we have to swim across to get to them or, and the moats are just like our fear and our like resistance to change and sometimes our insecurities about ourselves they never really go away like but i think there's a moment like i think you can tell when you know like when you show up to go for a jog or something and that's always never really and like you know sometimes when you when you don't work out for a while and you go to the gym it's really really hard but you know it's going to be good for you and you just kind of like trudge through it and it gets easier and easier and easier. But yeah, there's, 
just it feels like that's everything to a degree. <laughs> totally. I was even having this conversation with my husband last night and I was like, oh, you know, talking to a new client today, have this podcast interview. And he's like asking me, like, why do you do these things if they have you feel this way and not telling me to not do the things, but he was like actually curious. And I still haven't come up necessarily with an answer, but it was such a good question that kind of made me like stop and think, why do I keep doing these things? If I'm like, Oh God, they create some anxiety or this like inner turmoil. And I'm thinking like, why do I get myself into these situations? Like, I don't want to do it. And then it's like something when you're in it, like even being in this conversation with you right now, I'm like, so I'm in this conversation with Taylor, get to be connected with you and hear your wisdom and like strengthens relationship. And I'm like, who knows what other people might get from listening to this? Like there's already been so many things that you said. I'm like, oh, I imagine so many people can relate. And so I'm wondering for you, is there, there's always a moat, you know, like no matter what it is you're doing. And so is there something for you that like keeps, you know, that keeps you swimming, that keeps you going forward? Does it change with each thing? But yeah, like what's that thing that kind of pulls you forward and has you keep going? Mm, I think that's a great question. I don't know. I think there's a part of it that's like a willingness to want to always keep evolving and wanting to always grow and make the most of this life and this time. I would just regret it so much. Like if I didn't make myself uncomfortable to, to try and do something, you know, to just even try to do it and see what happens, like to follow that curiosity. And um, I think that's like how I've arrived at the place I am today doing these cooking jobs and the food photography and the eBooks and the, these things like, it started from like, well, why don't I just try it? Like, and see, there's like these little successes, these like moments where you're like, where it's like, you get a little bit of a taste of, wow, this is really working. This There's something that's really working about this. Like, it's like a spark. And oh, when the sparks start to like fly a little bit, you're like, wow, this could create a fire. And that's very exciting. And it- you owe it to yourself to, to try. And I think to see what could happen. And, and it was the inner calling that got me there. Is there anything that you haven't shared with us that you'd like to, since this is about inner calling, I would always suggest that, you know, people try to find more time alone to listen and also, I don't think it's that great to be busy all the time. I think we all as Americans or Canadians or in the West, we like really idolize busyness for whatever reason, but like it's, I think it's more important to be present in what you do rather than to be concentrating on like all the things you have scheduled for like this year and next year and telling everyone about it. And look how important I am. I have all these things I'm doing. Like, I I think it's better to feel present in what you're doing. You don't always have to be busy. And I highly suggest people find more time alone to Mm -hmm. focus on themselves and where they're at and internally. Is that part of your process? Like, I feel like you like do hikes alone and like, is that part of your process and kind of like how you maybe fine tune your like inner listening by just like spending time alone and being quiet? Yes. Yeah, it it is. And I notice, um, just like my activities, like after I do that are so much more like productive and the work is better. Like I'll notice, like if I do that, if I turn off my social medias and I go for a hike and I sit by the water, I feel the sunshine or I just like clear, try to clear my mind. Um, sometimes I'll chant some mantras on meditation beads. Like it just depends. I notice that I, after anything I do, after I do that is so much better. The work is just like infinitely better. And um, so I try to like get back to that 
And when I feel like I'm not, like when I feel like I am too busy and I'm not able to find that time, I don't know. I just think the investment is like, it pays for itself and like the quality of work that I do and the quality of conversations and um, interactions is so much better when I go and I have that like quiet time in nature or whatever it is and highly recommend that to anyone. Yeah. So good. I think that's a really good reminder or something new for people to really like heed what you're, what you're sharing that just importance of being alone and being quiet and spending that time. Cause I think it allows you, especially being in nature, like for me too, but it almost like allows you to more like, I don't, I don't know, sometimes like quiet out the noise and like, kind of like maybe fine tune that like inner listening. Um, and that's something I'm going to, you know, talk about as the show goes on about like ways to listen. But I think that's such an important point that you really have to kind of slow down and and be quiet. Yeah, Yeah. I 100% agree. And I, I think it's like, um, encouraging anyone to do that through a podcast or a conversation you're, you're helping them help themselves. I think the best way to help someone is to like, you know, just give them the knowledge, give them the, um, even the the space and the, the permission to feel like, Hey, you can go be alone and you can go spend time on yourself. And that's an amazing gift to give someone. Yeah. I think it's that just like self permission, or if you need to hear from somebody else, you know, like here we are, giving, giving you that permission. Yeah. So what's next for you? What's most alive in your world today? I'm really excited about some upcoming like cooking retreats and I'm working on a cookbook that I've been photographing and yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, hopefully we'll see how things, um, unfold, but I've just been really enjoying like, uh, writing the cookbook and photographing it and just focusing on, on that and being intentional and slowing down. Yeah. (laughs) I look forward to your next book. I have your, the first cookbook and it's so beautiful and the recipes are so good and your food is amazing. And I just really want to Thank you for, for being here, words of wisdom with us and for just being really open um, about your journey and yeah, just life and how it's unfolded for you. And I really appreciate you being here with us and I'm really grateful that we connected and that, yeah, we get to hear more of your story and, and be together. I think it's a great topic that you're, you're on. I can't think of a better topic than to talk about inner calling. All right, so that was our conversation with Sedona chef Taylor May Dean. And as we do at the end of every episode with a guest, I'm pulling out some questions from things that they brought up to share with you for some deeper contemplation and reflection. Question number one What is the internal feeling you are seeking? For Taylor, it was love, happiness, peace. What is it for you? A great quote that Taylor had that you might have noticed was, don't let your fear stop you from experiencing something that could be really beneficial. So the second question is, what is your fear stopping you from? And the last question, when was the last time that you had quiet time alone? And if it's been a really long time, By when will you create that for yourself? Thanks for listening. See you next time.